Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thanks again for, uh, I, I want to thank the organizers for putting together such a nice conference uh, a workshop. Uh, it's my first time here, I'm really enjoying it. So today I'm gonna to talk about, uh, I'm, I'm basically gonna focus more on MRI. So today, today I'm gonna talk about model-based deep learning beyond unrolling. So um, I don't have to convince you. I mean, uh, there, you already heard a few talks on MRI being slow and there are several trade-offs in static MRI. Uh, for example, there is a three-way trade-off between scan time, spatial resolution, and coverage in MRI. Now, the usual process is to understand, uh, collect uh, undersampled data and try to reconstruct it from undersampled data by using convex optimization schemes. So uh, compressed sensing algorithms usually follow a problem like this. So you have a data consistency term and you have a regularization term. So you usually use a label of regularization or other transforms that uh, you, you kind of handcraft. Now, how do we solve this? We, uh, there are so many different algorithms out there. One of the popular approaches is an alternating minimization algorithm. So you alternate between a denoising step and a data consistency enforcement step. So you alternate between these two steps until convert. So a typical algorithm would look like this. So you feed in undersampled data, you feed it through the denoising step, then you follow, use a conjugate gradient based enforcement of the data consistency and you alternate until convert. Now, uh, in the recent years, uh, so there had been a lot of work on replacing this by using unrolled algorithms. So there's some work from Dan Sorikson's group. Uh, there's some from Dan Rockett's group. I'm gonna talk mostly about our work uh, on model-based deep learning. Uh, so let me just explain what it is. So it uses a cost function exactly like uh, the compressed sensing. So it has, there's a data consistency term and a regularizes, regularization term. So the regularization term, unlike uh, compressed sensing, we use a deep network here. So this is a noise or LES estimate. Uh, so basically we are trying to find a solution that is consistent with the data and at the same time has lower noise or LES uh, components. So the way we implement this uh, the noise estimator is as shown here. So you basically take the original image and subtract it from a denoised image and that way you get an estimate for the noise. So the denoised image is obtained by using a convolutional neural net. So again, similar to compressed sensing, we use an alternating minimization algorithm. So we alternate between a denoiser. Right now, it is a deep network and followed by a conjugate gradient optimization. So the algorithm looks exactly like compressed sensing. Uh, you have a denoiser and a conjugate gradient algorithm. So this is iterated until convert. Now, how do we train the network? Okay, so there are two ways of doing this. One is like you pre-train this network by using uh, by training it as a denoiser and then put that into the um, algorithm. Okay, and that's called as a plug and play algorithm. But we found that uh, training it in end-to-end -end fashion actually gives better results. So how do we train this? So we unroll this. Uh, so th there are so many different methods to do this, but uh, we unroll this and then we see that this, this denoiser and so that is replicated, the weights are shared. And then we train this in an end-to-end -end fashion. So basically we feed in the understandable data here. So it's a deep network. So you get the reconstructed image here if the network is chosen correctly. Uh, if it's not, you get a bad image. So you look at the loss and you minimize the loss uh, and that way you train the neural network. So this are some early results. So this is uh, you know a, a few years old. So again, this is a six-fold acceleration. So uh, by using model-based deep learning, we were able to get something that's pretty close to the original image and compared to compressed sensing TV and technology regularization, it does better than uh, other methods. Now we pushed this in several directions. I'm going to focus on just one of them just to illustrate this. So this was in the context of uh, multi-shell diffusion MRI. So diffusion MRI collects uh, data with different diffusion weightings uh, in different directions. And from there, you can get uh, information about the brain connectivity and so on. Now, if you have multi-shell diffusion MRI, uh, in addition to the directions, you will be collecting data on multiple shells. And now you can fit in microstructural models that will give you useful information about inflammation, demyelination, axonal death, and so on. But you might have seen, uh, you might have guessed already. So this results in a very long acquisition time because right now we are talking about collecting a lot of images uh, for every single slice. And so uh, we went through the standard route. So we just started throwing away information. So rather than collecting all the data, we understand the queue space. And even on the samples we kept, we undersampled the K space. So we didn't collect all the K space data for every Q space sample. So essentially, we are doing a KQ undersample. Now, how do we solve this? So we use the model formulation as shown here. So right now we have two priors. So because we have K and Q space, so we use a separable prior. So we basically use the Q space prior to regularize along the Q space dimension and an image domain prior similar to what we considered before in the image domain. 
So the Q space prior, how do we train this? So this is actually a pre-trained model. So it's actually a mix of um, plug and play approach and uh, model-based deep learning. So we pre-train this diffusion manifold. So basically by using this microstructural model, so we know we, we assume we create a dictionary. So we use a microstructural model and vary all those parameters and create a rich dictionary uh, of signals. Now we learned that in a denoising fashion by using an auto encoder. And then uh, we just enforce this as shown in the previous slide. So uh, this is how the results look like. So basically I'm showing three different diffusion weightings. Uh, so if you just use uh, standard conjugate gradient send, you see that uh, the results, especially at the higher B, B encodings, are pretty noisy. Whereas if you use the Q model algorithm, because it uses these two priors, you get relatively clean preconstructions. Now we can use that to further accelerate it. So this is an acceleration by a factor of eight. So you can see that even at such high acceleration, it kind of holds up uh, uh, without a lot of noise amplification. Now, uh, from there, we can get uh, FA maps and other useful information. So you can see that even uh, at eightfold acceleration, you get useful information. Now, if you go to three shell diffusion data, because you have more Q space dimension, you can accelerate even further. So this is subject with multiple sclerosis, and there are some lesions pointed out there. So you can see that even if we go to 15 fold acceleration, we still are able to keep all that useful information. And again, uh, if you go beyond that, let's say if you go to 18 fold, you start to uh, lose information. So, so far I was talking about model-based deep learning and unrolling. So let me just take a second to look at some of the challenges with this approach. This is really powerful and it's very useful in a lot of applications. So since this is a deep learning workshop, I took the liberty of putting some of the deep learning algorithms on a graph here, okay? So what am I showing here? So on this axis, I'm showing at how much data is there in a scan, okay? For example, if you have a 2D slide, there's not a lot of case-based data in a particular scan. And if you go to higher dimensions, I mean, now the trend in MRI is to go to 3D, 4D, 5D, and so on. You've probably have already heard the talk by Otasso where he's pushing the dimension high. Now on this axis, I'm looking at how much training data is there. So thanks to fast MRI and all those great efforts, we have a lot more data than previously. So again, we can uh, use model-based algorithms or non-model-based algorithms to train these models in the efficient the 2D setting. So of course, as you use model-based algorithms, they are a little bit less data hungry compared to non-model-based algorithms. But again, uh, you can use that useful information in different ways. Now, when you go to higher dimensions, you see that there's less and less uh, models available for these methods, okay? So I talked about Q models. So here we used a separable model. There is deep cascade net and CineNet. net. They're all using separable models, okay? Why is that the case? The problem is these larger models, especially when you use unrolling, cannot fit on the GPU. And again, training data sets are really challenging to acquire in this case. So, so when, you, when you are talking about 5D data sets, it's almost impossible to collect the data with uh, in a fully sample mode. Now you have the other dimension. In MRI, we could collect, as Dan mentioned, you can collect the data with different contrast. Uh, you can collect the same data at field strength, anatomy, and so on. Now we know that deep learning algorithms are not so generalizable. Okay, so if you train an algorithm for T1 weighted MRI, it might not give the best performance on T2 or Flare. So are you going to create models for each specific contrast, each particular field strength, each particular resolution, each particular uh, matrix size, and so on? Of course, uh, this becomes a really challenging position because we need data for all of those particular cases. Now, can we build deep learning algorithms for the multi-dimensional setting? So that's one of the focus uh, of the rest of my talk. Now, another problem is the potential sensitivity of deep learning algorithms. You all have seen this picture. Uh, deep learning classifiers can be fooled by carefully crafted models. Uh, so this paper shows that the, uh, deep learning reconstruction algorithms are not uh, insensitive to those. I mean, if you carefully craft the input uh, perturbations, you will get uh, errors as shown in these reconstructions. Now let's look, go back to compressed sensing, okay? Compressed sensing, the performance is not as good as deep learning, but it has some benefits that we can hopefully leverage or hopefully uh, mo get motivated by. So compressed sensing, first of all, it has a well-defined cost function, unlike many of the deep learning algorithms. So this means that because the cost function is convex, you have a unique solution. Now we have robustness guarantee. So uh, this means that if you add noise, it doesn't matter whether it's adversarial noise or uh, Gaussian noise, the, the perturbation in the output is bound by some constant. Now the question is, can we build deep learning models that can guarantee uniqueness and robustness uh, by using iterative methods? So I'm gonna 
now introduce the memory efficient model based deep learning with robustness guarantee. So for the memory efficient TP, we are going to use deep equilibrium models. So again, these methods are starting to make its uh, appearance in MRI. So let me quickly explain what that is. So let's say we look at model. Model uses an iterative algorithm. So xk plus one is f of xk and theta are the parameters of this, uh, uh, this module here. Now we know that if you're just interested in forward propagation, which is what we use in inference, it's really memory efficient. You only have to store this on your GPU and you can iterate through it as many times as you want. Now, but when you look at training, we need to unroll it. So we need to unroll it to n iterations and being 10 or 20, depending upon the application, the more the better because that'll improve the performance. But this results a lot more memory and you it's almost impossible to train 3D or 4D models with this approach. Now, the DEQ approach uh, assumes that these iterations converges to a fixed point. So if you keep on iterating, hopefully it converges to a fixed point. If it converges to a fixed point, there is a nice recursive rule. So you can use this recursive rule to do back propagation. So this means that for forward propagation and backward propagation, you just need to store this module on your GPU and you can do forward propagation and backward propagation just by using iteration. There's a catch though. The catch is these algorithms need to converge and they have to converge to a unique fixed point. So how can we guarantee that these algorithms will converge to a unique fixed point? So this is where we introduce this constraint called as the monotone constraint. So let me explain what that is. So let's say we have a cost function as shown here and psi effect is a prior. Now, if you look at the stationarity condition, so you take the gradient of, gradient of that term with respect to x and set that equal to zero. So you have the data consistency term here and you have the prior here. For, uh, so f of x uh, is basically the neural network. For example, in the model, it is basically x minus dw of x. x is basically the image and this is the denoise image. Now, the key result here, I don't have time to explain this in detail, but the key result here is that the stationary point that you have here is unique if, if and only if f is a monotone operator. So the monotone condition is as shown here. So this basically says that uh, the difference, the output between uh, the difference in output for two different inputs uh, in a product with x minus y is greater than this constant. So again, some of you might have seen this in convex compressed sensing. So if psi is a convex function, f is guaranteed to be monotone, but it's not true in the other way around. So in fact, the monotone constraint is a generalization of compressed sensing or convex optimization. So the nice thing is that once you add this monotone constraint, you get all the guarantees that compressed sensing has. I mean, the algorithm converges to a fixed point. It's robust to input perturbations. So if you add some input perturbations, the output perturbations are bounded. And uh, the solution is unique, irrespective of what you choose as a operator. So now are we trading off performance here? Because we know that non-convex compressed sensing is more is better than convex compressed sensing. So we compared the algorithm. So this is the MOLLR algorithm. This is the, uh, the using the monotone constraint. And this is the model-based deep learning algorithm. Of course, we are taking a slight hit in PSNR, but you would you might see that the performance between the, the comparison between the two algorithms are pretty close. Now, the good thing is that this algorithm requires tenfold less memory. So this means that you can use uh, this approach to build larger models. So that's what we did in this application. So this is the CINI application. So with the CINI scheme, you can either solve uh, each of the images by using a 2D model, or you can build a larger model, which is a 3D model here. So you can see that the 3D model, of course, gives better performance, but unfortunately, we were not able to realize this using the model-based deep learning because of the unfolding step. Now, another benefit is a robustness. So let's say we trained uh, several different algorithms uh, in a relatively noiseless setting. So where, let's say we trained it with uh, standard MRI data. So you get good performance with all these methods, but let's say when we're adding noise, either adversarial noise or Gaussian noise, Obviously, the performance of all these algorithms are going to fall. But you might see that some of these algorithms, for example, model and ADMM net, it dra drops pretty drastically when you add adversarial perturbation, whereas this MOL algorithm, which is shown in green, kind of holds up. I mean, it, it gives the best compromise or the performance degrades in a graceful fashion. The same thing is true with Gaussian noise. I mean, the performance of these ADMM net and model does not degrade that drastically uh, to Gaussian noise compared to adversarial noise, but it still does. So you can appreciate this from uh, these images. So I'm just comparing two algorithms here just for clarity. So in the relatively noiseless case, you see that both algorithms do well. 
But if you add noise, model kind of completely breaks down. I mean, I agree that the amount of noise is a little bit on the high side, and it's probably not uh, common to add that or to have that noisy result. But the message is that these algorithms are highly vulnerable to uh, noise, whereas the algorithm, by adding this monotone constraint, kind of holds up. Again, we, this is not only true for model. I mean, all these algorithms are vulnerable to perturbations. Now, finally, uh, I just want to touch upon uh, this, uh, the generalization capability of the controlled algorithm. So we know that, and I have a model that's trained for a particular acquisition setting, for example, flyer at three Tesla. The same algorithm might not work well for another application. So this means that we need to train a lot of different models for each different training data set. And from a vendor perspective, you need to store all these models on your computer or on your scanner, and you need to choose the right one at the right on the fly. So the question is, can we come up with an adaptive model that will work for all settings? So the idea is really simple here. So all what we do is an adaptive, so this is inspired by adaptive instance normalization. So we modulate the features of the deep network by using some feature scaling vectors. And these feature scaling vectors are derived by a fully connected network. So we know a priori that the scanner is going to collect a T1 weighted scanner or a three Tesla scanner. So all that information is somewhere in the header. So we call that as metadata. So that metadata is fed to the perceptron, which gives the right scaling vectors. And that will guarantee that uh, it'll work for the right application. So this allows us to train it on a lot of different data sets. So we just took the T1, T2 flyer and T1 post contrast data from the fast MRI data set. We train all algorithms simultaneously. Uh, so, so the ADAM model algorithm was trained on all the different data sets together, just from just with six subjects per contrast. Uh, so now by contrast, we also train a independent model for each contrast. So for example, for T1 post contrast, we trained it by using six subjects. So that's the green one. And the red one is a model trained with 100 subjects per contrast. So you see that with very little data, the ADI model, so just with six subjects per uh, contrast, the ADI model algorithm can give better performance than uh, a model-based deep learning algorithm with about 100 subjects per contrast. Again, you can uh, probably visualize that from the images too. So this is the algorithm that was trained for all the settings together. So here, the good thing is that you only need to store one network on the scanner and you just have to change the metadata as the input. By contrast, uh, this uses all the data also, but you can see that the performance is a little bit worse. And the model I, uh, again, with 100 subjects is uh, a little bit uh, worse. I mean, it's not too bad, but, but it's comparable. Okay, so let me conclude here. So I uh, talked about model-based deep learning. So it's a really powerful method if you can fit everything on the memory. So, uh, to, and the other problem is the potential robustness issue. Uh, so if you add input perturbations, uh, it may be vulnerable to some of those uh, degradation. So the main message, the take home message of this talk is that by just being a little bit careful, so we just have to add that monotone constraint. It doesn't add a lot. Just by adding that constraint, we can get similar guarantees that, that compared to uh, similar to compressed sensing methods, which is actually a great thing. It's a provable guarantee. Now, the other benefit is that this gives tenfold reduction in memory demand, which, is, which allows us to train larger models. Now, I also introduced adaptive model. So this was originally introduced for model, but it can also be adapted to the MOL scheme. So here we just train a single model for multiple acquisition schemes. And on the fly, we can just change the metadata and make it work for different sets. Uh, actually, uh, so there's also some work that I wanted to talk about in the interest of time. I'll skip that. But this is, again, uh, talking about patient-specific models that can be trained in a similar fashion. But I'll be happy to talk to you if you're interested. Yeah, uh, hi, Matthew. Uh, what a nice work. So I think I'm missing one component of your memory efficient model. So why in your way it reaches the equilibrium, you do not need to unroll the network? Is that right? Can you repeat it? Oh, sorry. So in that memory efficient model, uh, not what you mean that when it, the solution X reaches the equilibrium, like uh, you do not need to unroll the network. Is that what, why? I, I do not. Oh, um, uh, that, let me just go back. Can do that because I'm the last, last presenter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
so, so you're talking about this slide probably, right? Yes, yes. So this uh, recursive rule only works if the algorithm converges to a fixed point. Okay, so, so you use the, so you basically differentiate the equation uh, with respect to the parameters theta at the equilibrium point, and that allows us to do the back propagation. So if it does not converge to a fixed point, none of this will work. Does that answer your question? Uh, sorry, I, I needed to digest. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the, the point is, uh, you know, unrolled algorithm, you just, you, you're unrolling it to n number of iterations, whether it converges or not, that's not a problem, all right? But deep equilibrium models, you can iterate to a lot more iterations, like 30, 40, 100 times, but then hopefully it'll converge to a fixed point. If it converges to a fixed point, you can use the fixed point rule that's shown here to do the back propagation. So you only have to store one net, one layer on your GPU, and you can do forward propagation and backward propagation with just a single layer. Do you have any other questions? I have a follow-up question in the leg size. <laughs> so you kind of assume that your your uh, function is convex, right? The the regularization and the neural network. Uh, how are you going to do that? Because we know that neural network uh, training is not, and uh, that regularization is not a convex function. Did you assume that it's locally convex after you reach some training state? Okay, that's an excellent question. So, in fact, we don't have this IFX, okay? So, IFX is a fictitious thing. So, all what you're working with is F of X, okay? So, F of X, we are constraining it to be a monotonous operator. And uh, actually, I had to delete that slide in the interest of time, but you can impose. So, so if I, um, well, maybe, uh, well, again, uh, if you recall, uh, f of x is written as x minus d of x, so it's a uh, it's a noise predictor, so it's a denoise denoise image subtracted from the original image, right? Yeah. So you impose a little constraint. So if you impose that the denoise to be a contraction, then automatically this f becomes a monotone operator. So it, it's actually easy to do, I and mean, there are several methods of doing it. For example, spectral normalization. So if you apply spectral normalization on each layer of your network, then it guarantees to be a contraction. And that really uh, ensures the monotone network. But you're right. I mean, it's impossible to create neural networks that are convex. So all of you saying is that this operator is monotone. That does not mean that the body effect is convex. I mean, this is a one is three. So if uh, if psi is convex, then f is monotone, but it's not true in the other way. Okay. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So my question is about the adaptive MODL. So so this work across, let's say, different uh, anatomies as a sampling pattern, or does it just work with uh, different contrasts? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually what we tried, I and mean, I showed only different contrasts in this work, but uh, in the paper that's on archive, we looked at uh, four different contrasts, different accelerations, like three, four, six, and so on, then two different free strengths. And of course it can be accounted with different anatomies. We haven't done that yet, but it, it is, possible to do that. Thank you. Sorry, very, very interesting uh, work. Yeah, sorry, I just have a follow up a question with this one. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like, how do you avoid like the trivial solution, like the network is not doing anything? Like, for instance, just the output is the same as the input. Uh, so, well, I mean, so the monitor, okay. Um, so you, you're saying, DW effects is X. Yeah, right. like DW thing is just doing nothing. Like yeah, so in that case, the, okay, so basically we are training this in an unrolled fashion, right? Not unrolling, but we are basically uh, doing it end to end, right? So if the network is not doing anything, you feed in some input, that's the out, in, uh, that, that will be the output. So your loss will make sure that that, that won't happen. Does that make sense? So let me back up. Uh, so if you look at this case here, right? So you're feeding in some crappy image here, and if the network is not doing anything, what comes out would be the, the sense solution or, or the least square solution. So the loss, when you're training it, that'll guarantee that that trivial solution won't be chosen. Yeah, so so it, it feels like this still the first part of the loss is still like driving the optimization, while the second part of loss is just trying to 
you know, enforce the, uh, like the um, uh, monotonicity here. Yeah, that's right. So, so the monotone constraint is just to make sure that, uh, you know, you can just work with one layer, okay? I mean, it's not, if you can unroll it, if you can fit it on the GPU, you don't need that monotone constraint. Mm -hmm. Does that, yeah, I mean, we can talk offline if it's not fully clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming.